Holocaust survivors tried to reach their ancestral home in every way possible, mostly in small unseaworthy vessels like the one behind me. This is a memorial to more than 3,000 of them who drowned making that perilous journey. 768 people died on one boat in early 1942, the Struma, having fled from Nazi-occupied Europe. One person survived. Many others also drowned while trying to run the British naval blockade of their promised homeland. Those who did make it were imprisoned in detention camps, either here in Atleet or on the island of Cyprus. By the very nation who had been mandated to recreate a national home for the Jewish people and to encourage their immigration. Then in July 1947, something happened that would publicly expose the plight of these homeless Jewish refugees, the Exodus incident. Out of Palestine comes the camera story of the Exodus, the Jewish immigrant ship that highlights new violence in the Holy Land. The British government sent its 4,500 Holocaust survivors back to Europe to be imprisoned again in displaced persons camps in the very country they were fleeing from, Germany. 4,000 Jews are once more back in the hated and dreaded country from which many of them began their long, desperate trip to Palestine. Many nations around the world, and especially the United States, called for the end of Britain's trusteeship of the mandate. The late Yossi Harel was the commander of the Exodus operation in July 1947. Many people connected that the, the ship, the state really was born when the Exodus came to Haifa and was the center of the fight to bring any Jew who wanted to come to come to Israel, and the, the reaction of the world uh, opinion. They, they saw the injustice which was done to people who survived Auschwitz. They don't have a place in this world. The only place which we believe we can have was Palestine. It just so happened that members of the United Nations Special Committee on Palestine were present at Haifa port when the exodus arrived. What they witnessed was a catalyst that brought about the historic Resolution 181 at the UN General Assembly on the 29th of November, 1947. Soviet Union, yes. United Kingdom, abstain. The United States, yes. The resolution of the Duck Committee for Palestine was adopted by 33 votes, 13 against. It is often claimed that this historic vote not only gave legitimacy to the State of Israel in international law, but also to the Palestinian Arabs for their own state as well. Is this the case? The answer is no. Generally speaking, in international law, General Assembly resolutions are not binding. If the Jewish people and the Arabs had agreed to enter into a treaty based on the terms of resolution, then rights and obligations could have been created in international law. But that didn't happen. The State of Israel was not created by the United Nations. This is a kind of misunderstanding. People tend to think that, that somehow Israel was created as a result of the partition plan. When the State of Israel was created on the 14th of May 1948, it was created or established on the basis of prior preceding legal situations. And those were the San Remo Resolution, which was incorporated into the Mandate for Palestine, which then transported itself or became the State of Israel. And we know that Article 80 of the UN Charter protects and preserves all pre-existing rights of peoples prior to 1945, when the UN was created. And we know that that applies to the situation in Palestine. The fact that the United Nations General Assembly recommended 
that the mandate for Palestine be split and partitioned does not change matters because that was just a recommendation. The United Nations General Assembly does not have the authority to change the borders of countries, make rules of international law, or do anything else of substance. And in any case, the recommendation that it made in 1947 to partition the mandate for Palestine was not adopted by the British. I want to make it clear that today, the Arab people, more specifically the Palestinians, do not have any rights or entitlements as a result of the partition resolution which was uh, presented uh, in November, on November 29, 1947. The very re re resolution that they rejected, that they refused to accept, was a recommendation of the General Assembly, not a binding document in international law. The Arab rejection of Resolution 181 precludes uh, the Arabs from any legal claim they might otherwise have to that territory. And moreover, um, the Arabs have actually not even recognized the right of the Jewish people to have a sovereign state. Not only did the Arabs reject Resolution 181 out of hand, but the very day after it was carried, they resorted to armed conflict against the Palestinian Jews. The aim? To try to thwart the possible emergence of any Jewish nation and to make Resolution 181 null and void. Nevertheless, the vote was passed with the required two-thirds majority, despite the abstention of the mandatory power Great Britain, who by this time had given notice that they were going to relinquish their stewardship of the mandate. What were the intentions of the British government? Britain went to the United Nations hoping that they will decide that uh, the, the, the whole country would be given to the Arabs, to, to, to King Abdullah from Jordan, because uh, King Abdullah was, he, he, his chief of staff, John Glab Pasha, he was a British officer. Then the Jordanian army will take all, all of Palestine, and King Abdullah with uh, his um, chief of staff, with the British chief of staff, will, will rule the whole of Palestine. Following Resolution 181 in the United Nations General Assembly, the declaration of a Jewish state in Palestine looked pretty certain. However, the surrounding Arab countries swore that they would invade and destroy an independent Jewish state as soon as it was declared. Any international lawyer will tell you that such an aggressive invasion is illegal under international law. Some years earlier, the British government had sent Field Marshal Viscount Montgomery to Palestine to assess their chances of survival in the event of an invasion by the surrounding Arab armies. Montgomery's assessment was that the Jewish state would last no more than three weeks. Instead of helping the Jewish community of Palestine to defend itself, Britain had imposed an arms embargo on the Jewish fighting forces, while at the same time arming and training the armies of Egypt and Jordan. Even before 1947, uh, you had the Iraqi um, prime minister calling for jihad against the Jews in Palestine. Once 1947 happens, um, almost everybody is doing it, not calling for war, they're calling for jihad by the name jihad. King Farouk of Egypt, his foreign minister, um, a whole bunch of others in Jordan and elsewhere are all stating um, this is a jihad war we're going to fight against the Jews. On the 14th of May 1948, Britain withdrew its forces from Palestine, thus ending its administration as the mandatory power. Later that same day, David Ben-Gurion declared the independence of the State of Israel in this very hall. It was the most momentous event in 2,000 years of Jewish history. You are listening to the voice of David Ben-Gurion, proclaiming the independence of the State of Israel. Nitkanasno, 
אנו חברי מועצת העם, נציגי היישוב העברי והתנועה הציונית. By virtue of the natural and historic right of the Jewish people and of the resolution of the General Assembly of the United Nations, we hereby proclaim the establishment of the Jewish state in Palestine to be called Medinat Yisrael, the state of Israel. And so the Jewish nation was reborn in the homeland from which it had been expelled nearly 19 centuries earlier. The commitment made to the Jewish people in the Balfour Declaration had eventually come to fruition. Sadly, in the end, the rebirth of the Jewish nation happened in spite of Britain rather than because of us. And even then it was only in a fraction of the territory allotted to them at the San Remo Conference. The other mandates that came out of the San Remo Conference of 1920 successfully gave birth to four Arab nations, Iraq and Jordan, also under the British, and Syria and Lebanon under the French. But when it came to the mandate for Palestine, it was a different story. Following a continual policy of appeasement of Arab demands in the final years of the mandate, the British government did everything it could to obstruct the emergence of a Jewish state. Britain actually forsook its sacred trust of civilization towards the Jewish people and from a legal perspective violated the terms of the mandate it had signed up to on almost every single level. Indeed, the British government refused to even recognize Israel as a sovereign state for several months after David Ben-Gurion gave his historic declaration here in this hall. The very day after Ben-Gurion's declaration of independence, five Arab armies invaded the Jewish state and attempted to annihilate it. That attempt failed. Nevertheless, seven decades later, the state of Israel continues to live under the constant threat of war and its legitimacy and even its very existence continues to be challenged. 